to the Stephen Toriello Show, building a platform of liberty for people in search of truth with a dash of hope and a life worth living. The Stephen Toriello Show. And you never know where Stephen may go. And now, here's Stephen. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the show. Pretty crazy week in the news. Uh, every time I get on here, I, th- I feel like I'm repeating the same thing. The, the news cycle has <laughs> just been crazy uh, and nothing has changed. So we got a lot to get to today. And as always, I'm going to try my best to squeeze all this in just one hour. Uh, we are going to do a live show because I'm kind of strapped for time right now. So I'm trying to get you guys a show out there to get you up to date with all the craziness that is happening around us. Um, we're going to get into the Trump indictment. We're going to get into uh, what Alan Dershowitz thinks about that. We're going to get into some old school law back in the 1940s from Justice Robert Jackson and how he felt about politicizing prosecution and how he was afraid that judges and prosecutors could take advantage of certain laws. Essentially, essentially, he was afraid that a prosecutor can go after anyone and, and rummage through the law books and find something on anybody they wanted, which is essentially – I'm afraid that's what they're doing to Donald Trump right now, and I think, I think that's going to be one of the defense's case. And listen, folks, if Donald Trump never did anything – If he never did anything, which we all know he did a lot during his administration, if if Donald Trump never did anything, he got people involved in politics. Politics is no longer boring, folks. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I happen to think it's a bad thing. I think politics should be boring. It should be slow. It should be uninteresting and really no broad sweeping changes of any sort. So – For it to be this crazy, I guess you could say it's a good thing because now people are starting to get informed on what's happening within their government and in the halls of Congress. So that's a good thing, I guess. And listen, the more people are informed, the better decisions they make. I say that all the time. And folks, with me, I haven't read – I've read more law constitutional law in regards of the Espionage Act and the Presidential Records Act that I, I've never read before, and it's actually quite interesting. And I'll just, I'm just going to say this. The the prosecution is going to have a tough time with this case. I don't, I don't think it's going to be as easy as the left is making it out to be. I think that's just wishful thinking on their end. And personally, I think from a 10,000 foot view, this is all a distraction, folks. It's all a distraction. This is nothing but election interference to kneecap Donald Trump in the election to try and get him to lose. And I think the best scenario that they're, they're hoping to get out of this is that they'll get Donald Trump to do a plea deal and he'll drop out of the race. And Donald Trump has already said that he's not going to do that and he's never going to give up. So it's going to get pretty interesting, folks. So we could just sit back, watch, and learn. We're, we're about ready to learn some crazy stuff when it comes to this. I mean, it is no doubt a constitutional crisis that the Democratic Party and, these, and this weaponized justice system and this radical administration and the entire Washington establishment swamp has put this country in. Without a doubt, we are heading right towards a constitutional crisis. My bad about that. Uh, it's live, folks. We're live. So we're going to have some crazy stuff like that. (laughs) All right. So we're going to get into a bunch of stuff today. A lot to get to. Um, First off, I want to I just want to step out and I want to say this. I don't think I've ever explained this. And if you've never I know you've heard this term a lot. But what is a democratic republic? We are a democratic republic. We are not a full on democracy and we are not a full on republic. We are a democratic republic. There's a big difference, folks. And I want to go ahead and read you kind of a a summary of what a democratic republic is, where it comes from and all that good stuff before we get into any before we move on, because all this is going to be correlated, folks. This entire show is going to be correlated to the rule of law. Democrats and the left are so obsessed with law, so let's maybe, if they're listening, teach them something. Um, So a democratic republic is a form of government that combines elements of both democracy and republicanism. 
In this system, the power to govern is derived from the people through the democratic processes of elections. While the country is organized as a republic, which means that the government's authority is limited by a constitution and the rule of law. In a democratic republic, the citizens have the right to vote and participate in decision making through elected representatives. These representatives are responsible for making and implementing laws on behalf of the people. The Constitution establishes the framework for the government, protects individual rights, and sets limits on the power of the government. The term democratic republic is often used to describe various countries, including the United States, where the government is both democratic and operates within a republican framework. It signifies a system that combines the principles of democracy, such as popular participation and majority rule, with the principles of a republic, including the rule of law and the protection of individual rights. And so that is just a quick summary of what a democratic republic is. And folks, never forget that we are a democratic republic. I'll never forget the first time that I that I talked to somebody that didn't know that they really thought I mean they were arguing up and down that we are a full blown democracy that just goes to show how many people out there are not are just not in tune with the inner workings of our government I am a firm believer that people should have to be able to recite the constitution in order to graduate high school like the constitution and the bill of rights because we, I think we're in the situation now because our citizenship lacks all knowledge of history. They know nothing about history. And unfortunately, history is one of the things that they're pulling more and more out of school, which is unfortunate, especially for our citizens. Because, listen, folks, there's no doubt right now we have a huge portion of this population that is just completely uninformed with a lot of our of how our government works, on how politics work, on what the Constitution is, what it represents, what it means, the founders, the Bill of Rights, what those mean, and how they protect citizenships and why all this stuff is so important. And in fact, they know so little of all these things that they don't care if it gets destroyed. They it's it means nothing to them. So its importance absolutely means nothing to the left. And obviously some Democrats, because they're always talking about how they they're defenders of democracy while actively and knowingly destroying democracy by swaying elections and letting the FBI and the weaponized government uh, meddle in our elections and then changing election laws weeks and months before uh, a federal election. So that election time takes weeks and months. They're perfectly fine with that as long as it's their desired outcome. So they don't care about democracy, folks. They do not care. Um, it, it, they, they don't care. They just they don't. First of all, most of them don't even know what it means. Um, and second of all, the ones that do know what it means, they don't like it. And this is the new age Democrats now, folks. This is why I left the party. I will never vote Democrat again in my life. And I don't know where the party's going, but they sure are driving this country right off a cliff. And we right now, folks, are at the precipice. This election coming up, I know you've heard this a thousand times and it is cliche. And I'm not saying that this country is finished if we don't win 2024, if these Democrats lose power uh, in 2024. I'm just saying things are going to get really, really, really bad. Um, so it's very important that people make the right decision in this coming election in 2024. Because it, it look, it's it's not going to be good, folks. I, in my last episode, I talked about how this country was heading towards totalitarianism, and we most certainly are. Uh, so, and that's and the, trust me, that's certainly not something we want to do. I I went, I gave five examples how totalitarian regimes rise to power without any pushback from the people, and we went through five of those examples, and all five of those examples resemble exactly what we're witnessing today. And it's actually quite eye-opening. Uh, it's actually kind of terrifying if you think about it, because we have so many people that aren't acknowledging it. And so I just wanted to familiarize you guys with what a democratic republic is. And so that from here on out, you know that we are not a democracy and we are not a republic. We are a democratic republic. So now you know, and you could share it with your friends. Um, First thing I want to get into is the names. 
folks, you, I think in this entire situation, I think it's very important that people remember the names that are involved in all of these impeachments, in all of these investigations, in everything, because it's the same people, folks. It is the same people that have from day one that have targeted Donald Trump. It is the same exact people now between investigations, impeachments. I'm talking people like Comey, Mueller, Strzok, Page, um, all of them, all of these people, Jack Smith and um, Adam Schiff, you guys remember that, Jamie Raskin, he's still out there saying if Donald Trump wins, he's, he's going to impeach him. Folks, he said that before Donald Trump was even inaugurated as president in 2016, he said he was going to impeach him. We cannot have a justice system like this. We cannot have a functioning Congress and a functioning government. If you have one side of the government that is just bloodthirsty for for they they have an unquenchable thirst for blood from one man and they will not stop until they get it. Look at the damage these people have caused to our country and just seven years, eight years, people don't even recognize this country anymore. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, I mean, when we're talking about this country being on the verge, uh, on the verge of, of being a totalitarian state, we got issues. I was not saying this stuff when I was a Democrat 10, 15 years ago, I was not saying this stuff. I, I walk out in the mornings and, and I don't even recognize America anymore. This isn't even it, it seems like we're some kind of third world banana republic, man, with the with the stuff that we're witnessing. Come on, using with federal government be, colluding with with social media platforms to censor people's speech, to censor media outlets like the New York Post or a, a federalized weaponized justice system targeting a sitting president, a, a, a uh, intel agency spying on presidential campaigns like, yeah, I get like this stuff has been around. But not to this degree, man. Like, we are watching some pretty crazy stuff unfold in our country right now. And it's all coming from one side, folks. You have the Republicans right here trying to get to the bottom of what we all know is true. Folks, we all know deep down inside, whether you admit it or not, that the Biden family is corrupt, just like we know all the other politicians are corrupt. And if you were to put just a fraction, if the Justice Department would put just a fraction of the resources they put in the Donald Trump into all the other po politicians that have been in Washington, D.C. swamp for 40, 50 years, do you know how many people would be indicted? I mean, it would essentially clean house. They know they can't bring a special counsel to Joe Biden. I remember reading on a show the requirements in order to appoint a special counsel. And Joe Biden meets the requirements 10 times over. And yet there's not a special counsel. Why? Because they know if they appoint a special counsel to Joe Biden when it comes to this bribery scandal, to these now audio tapes that are supposedly out there, they know that he's going to have to be impeached. He's going to get indicted. And they know this. Folks, there's a special counsel. I, I can't even get into it right now because it's going to take so long to get through all this stuff. And I told you I would do a show about it, but there's just still more that is coming out when it comes to the Biden scandal. Every single day, something comes out. And so the last time we talked about the Biden scandal... There was no audio tapes. Now, supposedly, there's audio tapes now. There's 17 audio tapes that Grassley said that this Burisma executive has. 15 are from him speaking with Hunter Biden. And two of them is this Burisma executive talking to Joe Biden himself, the big guy. And I guess he even references, he even refers to him as the big guy into the, in the audio tapes. So the same informant that, that, turn the people on to this document that they almost held Chris Ray in contempt for that same document. Supposedly it was redacted for certain people, but not for others, I guess. And in that document, Chuck Rasley said that the, the informant says there's audio tapes that the executive has, um, uh, folks, this, at what point do they issue a special counsel? I mean, at what point does it have to get? How much evidence needs to come out before they appoint a special counsel? And honestly, I ask this question all the time to people on the left on Twitter and Facebook, and I, I just respond back to them and just say, I, honestly, I don't think there's any amount of evidence that could come out that you would agree 
that a special counsel needs to be appointed, or you would agree there needs to be a congressional investigation as far as a bipartisan investigation. It's only one side investigating this. And that's why I say all this is politicized to get Donald Trump. Uh, Alan Dershowitz's book that's coming out, and I want to get because I want to read it. It's extremely interesting. This guy, he defended Donald Trump, and he's a Biden voter. He's a Clinton. He's a Democrat. He voted for Clinton. He's saying that he's been defending Donald Trump since his first impeachment, and he is pro-Constitution. He is Constitution first. And every single case they bring up against Donald Trump, this guy just sits back and says, no, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. That's not good. You're not doing it right. And so he calls these people out, and he ends up being right. It's like he's the only rational one out of all this, and, and, and he's a Democrat. And so that's what brings me to my first story. This is what's interesting, folks. So like I said, you got to stick with the names. Be familiar with the names. All these people all know each other. It's a big freaking swamp in there. And all the swamp creatures all know each other. They all hang out. They they share information with one another. It's a big mess in our capital, folks. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. It's not good. We need a major, major swamp draining. And it's unfortunate Donald Trump didn't do it when he was there. But I do have to say, I got to give him the benefit of the doubt. I don't think he knew it was as bad as he as he thought. I, I I don't think he knew how bad it was, folks. I think, and personally, I didn't either. I thought it was just a few bad actors at the top. No, folks, this entire corrupt temple is just filled with nepotism and just just corruption. It is just so dirty. This is what happens when you have decades and decades of just power hungry people all hanging out with one another and doing favors for one another and getting their kids and getting their family involved and everyone knows each other. It's just disgusting, folks. It's a disgusting party. It's a disgusting situation. And it's and none of us, none of us are, none of us even know what is going on there. It's just them in their tiny little bubble. That's why I always say that these people know nothing about the real world. They know nothing about what is happening outside <clears throat> in real America. These people don't know all they know is, is they know they got to get rid of Donald Trump or else their asses are grass. That's what they know. And you know this because of the Comey audio. You know this because what Comey said in that interview with Jen Psaki, who is now working for, I think, MSNBC, who was a former White House press secretary. So that just goes to show you how corrupted and just intertwined all this corruption is. You have people that leave government and go into media, people that leave media, go into government. It's just all a nasty cesspool, man. It is just a nasty, nasty swamp. And so Comey essentially said he's afraid. He's afraid of Donald Trump getting elected because there's going to be retribution. You've said that Trump poses a near existential threat to the rule of law. And, and this is something similar language that I hear privately from national security officials, some people you and I both know who will say this privately about what a second term could mean. But tell me a little bit about the specifics of what he could try to do. What do you mean by that? Well, think about what four years of a retribution presidency might look like. He could order the investigation and prosecution of individuals who he sees as enemies. I'm sure I'm on the enemies list because the president constitutionally does oversee the executive branch entirely, which includes the Department of Justice, prosecutors and investigators. And so he could commission direct that individuals be pursued. He could also direct all kinds of other conduct that people would maybe take to court to try to stop. But who enforces court orders? Mm -hmm. Mostly the United States Marshals Service, which is in part of the executive branch and reports to the president. And so President Trump could say, I don't care what the Supreme Court says or these district judges say. I'm telling the Marshals Service, don't enforce the court order. And so our Constitution really does give a rogue president, which is what this would be, tremendous power to destroy. And so that's why I'm trying to warn people, given the way he said he intends to operate if he's reelected, this will be something we could never have imagined. Again, it seems like science fiction in a way, but it's what another four years of Donald Trump really promises, which is why... People criticize CNN for their town hall. I want the American people to stare at the threat that we're facing 
and understand that they cannot take the next election off. So essentially what he's saying is, is we all did bad shit and they're all afraid that if Donald Trump gets elected, they're all going to be held accountable. I mean, is that not clear and obvious to people that we have just an entirely corrupt system uh, running this country while we're out here suffering, you know, having to figure out whether we fill our gas tank or get groceries like this is awful, folks. And I'm just I'm, it's just a shame that we have millions of people that are just so blinded by hatred that they can't see it. They cannot see it. When I was a Democrat, we hated the establishment. We hated, we always spoke truth to power. We always wanted the media. And that's when CNN was actually unbiased news and was in airports and it was all around the world and it was great, man. But now, now they're just a, it's, it's an apparatus for the Democratic Party and the, and the establishment. They are the establishment now, folks. Their job exists for one reason and one reason only. That is to run cover for Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. That is it. And you can't even say the same about Fox News because Fox News fires people like Tucker Carlson and they get rid of people like Dan Bongino, the one people that were actually helping and, and talking crap to the Democrats. They got rid of them. I'm not saying that no one else talks crap about the Democrats or no one else sticks up for the Republicans, but that's one channel, folks. One. One. And that brings me to my other thing that we're going to talk about, or I just, you know what, I'll bring it up now. When you type in and you Google Donald Trump indictment or Donald Trump classified document indictment, it pops up 150 different media outlets all editorializing and giving their opinions on how screwed Donald Trump is. And then on like the 15th page, you'll find a Republican outlet or a conservative outlet that actually has some rationale behind all this and says that Donald Trump is innocent to proven guilty and we're going to let the law play out. I mean, seriously, folks, the left and the media or the left, the Democrat and this this disgusting government swamp that we're dealing with. They're, they're all in the same thing. They're all the same damn entity, man. It's like one giant swamp. And so you got to pay attention to the names. And one of the names is Stephen D'Antuono. You guys have heard this name before. I know you have. So Stephen Dan is Stephen. I'm, I'm trying to make sure I pronounce his right. This his name, right? It's kind of hard. Antuono. So Stephen D'Antuono announces sudden retirement. This is the American Digest article back in November in 2022. So just bear with me here. Stephen D'Antuono. So the Daily Wire reports that Stephen D'Antuono, one of the FBI's top officials, is suddenly retiring. So D'Antuono has been working as the assistant director at the FBI's Washington field office. He has been there ever since October 2020, when he was promoted from his previous position as the special agent in charge of the FBI's Detroit field office. Okay, starting to sound familiar now. Detroit, Washington. All right, so D'Antuono in recent years has been part of some of the biggest investigations that the agency has carried out. This includes the FBI's investigation of the conspiracy to kidnap Mich Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, which D'Antuono oversaw while leading the Detroit field office. It also includes the FBI's investigation into the Capitol protests of January 6, 2021. D'Antuono, during his time at the FBI Washington field office, has been one of the leading supervisors of this investigation. Now, however, D'Antuono is suddenly retiring. So FBI Director Christopher Wray has circulated an internal FBI memo that in part reads, I'm pleased to announce that David Sundberg will serve as the next assistant director in charge of the Washington field office. He replaces Steve D'Antuono, who is retiring at the end of this month. So the big question is, of course, is why the sudden resignation. So the short answer is, is that we don't know because the FBI hasn't said. This is back in 2022, remember. But there are some theories out there based in circumstances of this retirement. The most conspicuous circumstance is the midterm elections. At the time of this writing, control of the House has yet to be decided, but it is expected to go to Republicans, and Republicans, if given control of the House, have vowed to conduct a number of investigations into a wide range of issues. Okay, so this was back in 2022. Okay, just a summary real quick. D'Antuono oversaw the entire entrapment case of Gretchen Whitmer. He was the one in charge of assigning 12 or 13 FBI agents to like 14 um, some militia men. I don't know who they were. They were in some kind of group like the Oath, the Oath Keepers or something. So there was like 13 or 14 guys 
that were sitting there talking online with one another, shooting the shit, and then an FBI agent and informant comes in. Uh, he actually worked, I think, for the post office, and then some, somehow they allowed him into their little group. He had to go through like some initiation and all this stuff, and he was actually working with the FBI. So he contacted the FBI saying he was concerned that these guys were talking about you know, kidnapping this and blowing up bridges and doing that, doing this, just talking about it on private messages. All right. So he calls the FBI or he talks to his buddy. His buddy gets him in contact with the FBI. The FBI brings him on as an informant. Now he's on the inside. So since then, since that one guy at the end of all of this, there was like 12 or 13 FBI informants working on with these. There was like nine or 10 of these guys that were talking all this craziness. Well, these 13 FBI agents were actually planning everything. They were buying the guy's lunch. They were kind of, they incentivized almost, they created the entire thing, which is why most of these guys got off on entrapment. I, I think except for one. So all these people got let go for entrapment. And this guy, Stephen and D'Antuono was the lead investigator in charge, was the lead, the head agent in charge of all that. Well, after that debacle, okay, instead of being fired, like what most people would do when you suck at a job or you get caught doing something extremely bad, potentially illegal, certainly unconstitutional and trapping your fellow Americans, much like January 6th. Aha, that brings me to my next thing. Instead of getting fired, Stephen D'Antuono got promoted. Right. I mean, it only makes sense. Only in Washington, D.C., folks, only in Washington, D.C. And that, in fact, is exactly where he went. He went from the Detroit field office to the head honcho. This is a huge promotion for him, folks, going from some ring dink field office in D.C. or in in uh, in Michigan to now you're at the head honcho in Washington, D.C. at the swamp itself. You are that building that is behind all of this corruption who has been the, the seed to the corruption in this country for the last five decades. So he gets put in a position, a lead position in the January 6th riot investigation. So he's the lead guy going after all the fellow Americans that were at January 6th that day. So go figure. They were like, man, this guy's great at entrapping. He did so good at entrapping these guys. We should just bring him over here. I mean, this guy's a savage. Let's let's bring that savage over here and have him savage on some American citizens, uh, so potentially innocent Americans that were just standing on the on the grassy knoll out there that were just standing out there on the Capitol grounds. Let's get him over here. He obviously don't care about his fellow Americans. Bring him on in. Give him a promotion. He did a great job. So anyways, he resigns. According to American Digest back in 2022, however, since because of the Trump indictment, this news really never got touched down on. So Stephen D'Antuono got called in for a transcribed interview, and I got an article here from the Washington Times and hat tip to Kerry Pickett dated June 9th, right? So that was around the same time, I think, that the Trump indictment was happening. So all this kind of got overshadowed by the Trump indictment. I am told you, folks, that entire indictment was nothing but a distraction to all the stuff happening around us, like China preparing for war and uh, Joe Biden issuing, uh, sending more money over to Ukraine. Ukraine's on a big offensive, uh, getting supposedly losing all the tanks that we gave them. We gave them, they've lost like 15, uh, Abrams tanks already, the uh, the old school Abrams that we gave them. And look, this is the kind of stuff that's happening. Obviously, the entire Biden scandal, that's what happened on Thursday. So nobody finds that coincidental on the left, that the same day that Joe Biden gets gets caught getting millions of dollars, Joe Biden himself, folks, not Hunter Biden, he got $5 million too, but Joe Biden himself had allegedly got $5 million as well. So that's $10 million from Ukraine. All right. Ukraine, his favorite place. You guys remember when he said that? You guys remember? Oh, supposedly this entire thing all stems back to Ukraine, folks. Ukraine is all of this. You guys remember the quid pro quo Joe Biden pretty much announced on live television in front a live television in front of everybody bragging about how he got a prosecutor fired. I got all the good ones. Uh, uh, and uh, so I got Ukraine and uh um, I remember going over convincing our team, our <coughs> others, to convincing us that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, I guess, the 
12th, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion-dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to the press conference. Said, "No, nah. I said I'm not going to. We're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, "You're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here." And I think it was what six hours. I looked. I said, "I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money." Oh, son of a bitch! <laughs> Got fired. Well, supposedly this scandal and these audio tapes that they want, everything has to do with that quid pro quo back in Ukraine, where his son was getting paid millions of dollars to sit on the corrupt board of Burisma. The Burisma was being investigated by this investigator. Joe Biden had said if they don't fire the investigator, they're not getting a billion dollars. And so he essentially leverage taxpayer money in order to get a Ukrainian prosecutor fired that was investigating his his son. All right. So that's a quid pro quo, guys. All this stuff leads back to Ukraine. But this particular situation got overshadowed. So Stephen D'Antuono did a transcribed interview and I got the article here. So it's titled FBI official in charge of Mar-a-Lago raid had strong misgivings about the operation. So that's one thing that I I forgot to tell you. This guy was also in charge of the Mar-a-Lago raid. So the senior FBI official involved in planning the raid of former President Donald Trump's Florida residence told Congress two days ago he had strong reservations about the operation and the investigation. The House Judiciary released new information about the raid of Mr. Trump's residence and his indictment that details several deviations from the Justice Department's usual protocol. The information was provided to committee via June 7th, a transcribed interview of Stephen D'Antuono, the former assistant director in charge of the FBI's Washington field office. So think about that, folks. You have FBI here in Florida. Why did they send an outside third party FBI to come down here to Florida? Because they didn't even ask for permission to come down here. They just loaded up people that they thought would go with the plan and they took and they brought them down here, flew them down here, taxpayer money, and they raided Donald Trump's home. They raided his home. All right, so details of Mr. D'Antuono's interview were related to Attorney General Merrick Garland in a letter from House House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan. According to the letter, Mr. D'Antuono expressed strong concerns with the department's pursuit of the raid and noted several unusual aspects in the department's handling of the case. The FBI declined a request for comment from The Washington Times. The Justice Department did not respond to a request for comment. Mr. D'Antuono, a 20-year FBI veteran, was concerned that the Bureau was going to be left holding the bag again regarding the search for Mr. Trump's residence. He described several abnormalities in the investigation of Mr. Trump. First, the Miami field office did not conduct the search. Mr. D'Antuono testified that the FBI headquarters decided to assign the execution of the search warrant to the Washington field office, despite the location of the search happening in the region of the Miami field office. Mr. D'Antuono said that he, quote, absolutely no idea why the decision was made and asked why the Miami Miami field office was not spearheading the case. He noted that the Bureau learned a lot of stuff from the crossfire hurricane probe of Trump-Russia collusion, such as that the FBI headquarters does not work the investigation. It is supposed to be the field offices working the investigations. Hmm. That's kind of unusual, right? Kind of out of the ordinary. All right, we continue. The FBI's response to the May 2023 report of special counsel John Durham, who investigated the FBI's pursuit of Trump Russia collusion, was the investigations was that investigation should be run out of the field and not from Washington. Okay. So this is in the John Durham report that in the report all of the investigations are supposed to be ran out of the field and not from Washington. So, so the Miami field office or whatever, I, which I think it is down in Miami, they should have been handling this warrant, but they didn't. Not only did they not, they didn't even ask them or didn't even contact them before coming down here. Pretty fishy stuff, folks. Pay attention. It's, this, is getting, this is getting crazy. Um, it's just a theory of mine, but I think you're going to like it. It's pretty interesting. So Mr. D'Antuono also told the committee that the Justice Department did not assign a U.S. attorney's office to investigate the classified documents matter at Mar-a-Lago. He explained that, quote, 
He didn't understand why there wasn't a U.S. attorney assigned and raised this concern a lot with department officials because this was out of the ordinary. The former FBI official said that he, quote, never got a good answer and was told that the National Security Division would handle this matter with Jay Bratt, who leads the department's counterintelligence division as the lead prosecutor on the case. Mr. Bratt is the same department lawyer who allegedly pursued a lawyer representing Walt Nata. Um, I don't know, uh, representing Walt Nauta, an employee of Mr. Trump, who was also indicted for obstructing the classified document investigation. Uh Aha. See, so they're using key people that have, um, you know, they have vendettas. They have they have these almost like they have this blood, this bloodthirst to get these certain people. Um, So like Mr. Bratt is one of them. So they specifically went out of their way to get this guy, Mr. Bratt. So Mr. Bratt is in the same department lawyer who allegedly pursued a lawyer representing Walt Nada, an an employee of Mr. Trump, who was also indicted for obstructing classified document investigations. So this is just like I told you, one of the tactics that that totalitarians use is that they they essentially use other people to send a message so that lawyers are afraid to represent Donald Trump or they're afraid to even go around Donald Trump for per- because of afraid of persecution to be just anybody being around Trump anybody his in, in his orbit is a potential target and that's exactly what's happening they will go after his lawyers they go they will go after his lawyers lawyers they will go after anybody Look at how many people that surrounded themselves with Donald Trump have been targeted so far. Okay? Only Donald Trump people. That's it. Nobody else. We don't hear of anyone else being targeted like this. Just people in Trump's orbit. That's because they are trying to get to Donald Trump. They're trying to use these people to send a message to anybody else. That's why Donald Trump's lawyers right now that are representing him in these cases— These are brave people, folks, because they are most certainly going to be targeted for sure. And I'm sure you're going to be seeing that coming soon. We're already hearing about, you know, uh, uh, um, intimidation, plaintiff intimidation and, 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 and all that stuff. So it's going to get crazy. All right. So here we go back to the article. In a CNN interview Thursday night, former Trump lawyer James Trusty said Mr. Bratt threatened to deep six an application for a federal judgeship by Mr. Nauta's lawyer, Stanley Woodward. Um, I don't know what deep six means. Um, What's deep six mean? Let's find this out right now. We're live, folks. We're live. All right. I've heard of this before. All right. So the phrase deep six is an idiomatic expression that means to discard or get rid of something completely, usually by burying or throwing it away. All right. So now we know what deep six means. So apparently, Mr. Um... Mr. Bratt threatened to deep six an application for a federal judgeship by Mr. Nuita's lawyer, Stanley Woodward. So essentially he was going to throw away an application for for this guy being a federal judge. (laughs) Jesus. So me. So Mr. D'Antuono also does said that he was not the bureau that first sought to set up a search of Mr. Trump's residence. He recalled a meeting in which Justice Department officials pressured the FBI to immediately execute the search warrant. Mr. D'Antuono said he believed that the FBI, before choosing to execute the search warrant, should have asked for consent to search the premises. Mr. D'Antuono told the committee that he believed either Mr. Garland or the FBI director, Christopher Wray, decided to seek a search warrant despite opposition from the line agents working the case, according to Mr. Jordan's letter. A federal indictment unsealed Friday alleges Mr. Trump retained nuclear secrets and papers on foreign weapons, foreign weapon systems at his Mar-a-Lago estate and waved around military plans to persons without proper clearance in 2021. So this is the Washington Times. So I'm just going to go ahead and say none of that stuff is true, folks. None of that stuff is in the indictment. So this is why it's important. This is where editorializing comes into play. All right. None of that stuff is true. They have no idea what was in those documents, folks. Why? Because they were classified documents. Okay. Classified documents. They're not going to be like, oh, well, these are classified documents. Oh, really? What was in the documents? No, they're not going to do that. They don't know what was in these documents. In fact, the one that's in question, the one that they claimed he was waving around, they don't even have. Okay, the government doesn't have it. Nobody knows about this document. Nobody knows where it's at. So like, you know what I mean? So how can they say that he was waving something around 
when they don't even have it. So I, this is what I don't understand. Anyways, we're not going to get into the Trump indictment right now. Um, okay. So that was pretty much the end of that article. That was just pretty much the rest of it was this certain reporter giving their opinion on all the stuff that they don't know about the indictment of pretty much, uh, asserting that Donald Trump is guilty before proven innocent. And that's, uh, unfortunately how our justice system goes. Um, I And that brings me to my next point. I think Stephen D'Antuono is going to be a main witness in the defense of Donald Trump. Donald Trump's defense team is going to use Steve D'Antuono to essentially tell the judge, I think they're going to file a motion. Like I said, I am not a lawyer, folks. I've just been reading a lot of law in the last couple of days because of all this, which is great. It's always good to brush up on constitutional law and the Espionage Act and the Presidential Records Act. First of all, I'm going to just go right out there and say it. I think this entire case is moot because, first of all, I think the first motion that these that this defense team is going to push out there, and I think they should, is that the entire raid to begin with was unconstitutional, folks. They need to claim, and maybe I don't know if they can do this in a motion or if this is something they have to do at trial. But you have to roll this all the way back to should the raid have been done in the first place because it, because it's obvious that it was politicized and it was weaponized. It was obvious that there was a motive here and it wasn't a motive to just issue a search warrant. They were doing specific things. They did not reach out. They did not give warning. They did not do anything that they normally would do. They didn't let the field agents handle it. They wanted their agents from Washington, D.C. office to handle it. We all know how corrupt that place is. And so none of this stuff is normal. None of this stuff follows normal protocol, just like Stephen D'Antuono said, which is crazy because this guy is the same guy that was ahead of that corrupt ordeal in, in, in Michigan, and he was part of the corrupt ordeal in Washington, D.C., with the January 6th protesters. And not only that, but he was also part of this Mar-a-Lago raid. He was supposed to be the lead agent in charge for this raid. And he essentially retired in November of 2022. And now it seems like he's coming out, folks. I think what's happening is I think his conscience is getting to him. I think he knows if he doesn't essentially come out now, then he's going to be screwed because they're going to get to the bottom of this. And I think all this is going to come out eventually, and he's just trying to clear his plate before it happens. I think maybe they offered him some kind of immunity deal or something to do this interview. I don't know. All I know is that this, is, this guy is a key witness, or should be, in Donald Trump's defense for the simple fact that he can, he can say he is... He is essentially saying like the FBI, what they did was not right. What they did was unconstitutional and should have never been done in the first place. He's essentially calling out all the abnormalities. He's he's calling out all the all the protocol that was broke and all the all, all the stuff that shouldn't have been done that was done. So if the defense team of Donald Trump can roll this all the way back to Mar-a-Lago not even being raided in the first place, then none of this stuff even matters, folks. None of it. And I'll be the first to say this, that those documents were apparently more classified in Donald Trump's possession than they are now in the FBI's possession. Because before, did anybody ever hear about documents Donald Trump had? No. Why? Because, <laughs> because they were classified. Now... This, because of all this, the FBI, what did they do? They took pictures of classified documents sprawled all over the floor that they did, apparently. So the leftists get to share this picture of documents spread out over, all over the floor, which apparently the FBI agents specifically spread out on the floor so that they could take a picture of it. You see what I'm saying, folks? Like, so who is more damaging to classify documents? Donald Trump that had them put away or these people sprawling him out on the floor to take a picture of them to post on Twitter? <laughs> I'm just saying, like, nobody even knew about these documents before they started bringing all this stuff out. So you got to think about that. So like I said, I think this is going to be key defense in Donald Trump. Uh, I think this is going to be a key witness in Donald Trump's defense, and it should be. I'm not a lawyer. I'm sure these guys are probably the best attorneys on the face of the planet. You have to be to handle this kind of case. Alan Dershowitz, which is another probably best lawyer on the face of the planet, a liberal Democrat Biden voter who says this case is essentially moot. The only thing he worries about is whatever Donald Trump was waving 
in that document, but they don't know what that document was. All they know, they have an audio recording of him, which is kind of sneaky, folks. Like, all this whole thing is pretty sneaky. And you think about this. If they were to put resources into anybody, me, you, or especially any politician in government, do you know how much stuff they would probably come up with? Do you know, that's what's scary and terrifying about a weaponized justice system like this. This is what scares the hell out of me because they devote enough time to anybody if, and, and they watch them long enough or investigate them long enough and they, and they scrummage and they rummage through law books, they'll find something, folks, and that is not not how the law is supposed to work. And the reason why I say that is Justice Robert Jackson. Um, now, he didn't quote it, but this was this was a big ordeal to him in the 1949 case of United States versus United Mine Workers of America. So uh, Justice Robert Jackson expressed concerns about the potential abuse of the law in his dissenting opinion in 1949 case, the United States versus United Mine Workers of America. He cautioned against the idea that prosecutors could find a legal charge against anyone if they searched through the law books extensively. So Jackson believed in the importance of the law being clear and predictable rather than subject to subjective interpretations that could be manipulated for personal or political purposes. His views highlighted the need for fairness and restraint in the application of the law. And this right here, folks, is probably going to be another motion and another law or another case that's cited in Donald Trump's defense. It is clear and obvious that the law is being manipulated here right now for political gain. There is no doubt about it. You have Joe Biden, the sitting president, is sending and sicking his Department of Justice, which who is who needs to be impeached, by the way. Merrick Garland needs to absolutely be impeached. I'm going to say that right now. This is something that people need to be fighting for and calling your congressman for right now. This man has caused so much damage to this country for whatever reason. Whether he's pissed off because he couldn't be a Supreme Court judge and and something happened with that, the Republicans stopped him from being a Supreme Court judge. Thank God, folks. Could you imagine if this corrupt little weasel was on the Supreme Court seat? Jesus. We'd all be screwed. Imagine the imagine the interpretations this guy would make of the law if this is his doing right here. Essentially what they're doing is they're weaponizing the law in ways it shouldn't be. They're weaponizing the law for political purposes. Joe Biden is seeking his Department of Justice on his chief rival in the upcoming 2024 election. Can you imagine, folks, if Donald Trump did this? Could you imagine if Donald Trump in 2020 or in 2019 or, yeah, in, could you imagine in two, 2019 Donald Trump, after knowing Joe Biden was the nominee, if he sent Bill Barr after Joe Biden to pull up all these document scandals and everything like that, do you, do you know how much the left would lose their freaking minds, dude? Like they would be apoplectic. They, their freaking hairs would be on fire. They would have sent articles of impeachment right up there. They would have been voting on it and he would have been impeached for a third time for weaponizing the justice system against his political opponent. But here Joe Biden does it and it's no big deal. No big deal. We're supposed to pretend that Joe Biden doesn't know anything about this investigation. He doesn't know anything about Merrick Garland going after Donald Trump. He doesn't know anything about his son's business deals. None of it. He's completely clueless about all of it. Now, I do have to say the man is pretty dumb. Always has been. But I guarantee you, folks, dumb doesn't mean you can't be corrupt. This guy is corrupted. He is the most, he is the definition of a corrupt, dirty Washington politician, Joe Biden. 50 years in politics, folks. 50 years of lies, 50 years of corruption, 50 years of power, greed, manipulation. He is the worst of the worst. And he's not even a good guy. This is what I don't get. He is not even a good guy. He's very arrogant. OK, and I'm not saying I mean, look, Donald Trump is as arrogant as they get, but I'm saying like this guy is no better than Donald Trump. But yet we're supposed to hold him to a higher pedestal and he's supposed to be able to just get away with every whatever he wants. This is the problem with our politics, folks. This is the problem with Washington, D.C. Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Lois Lerner. All of them, all of these corrupt people that have broke the law were given the benefit of the doubt. 
except for Donald Trump. It's actually the opposite. They have an entire Justice Department scouring through their law books, trying to find a crime and then pin it onto Donald Trump. It is completely opposite of how our justice system is supposed to work. And if Robert Jackson, if Justice Robert Jackson was still here, I think he would be a great person to talk to about this. Because this is something he feared a lot. And it's not just him. This was something our founders feared a lot, too. And judges and prosecutors having too much power. Our founders did not want any section of our government to have more power than the other. They wanted all of them to be tied down with chains. And I forget who wrote that quote. There was a quote that it was, uh, it was, I think it was a picture in the Federalist Papers where it was a, a giant person and there was a bunch of people around him with rope holding the person down to the ground. I can't remember if that was in the Federalist Papers or not when they used to write the Federalist Papers before the, before the Bill of Rights was, was ratified. So again, folks, this is no doubt a political persecution. Okay, it, it, this, this is what Donald Trump's main defense needs to be. There is no doubt that this Department of Justice has been politicized and weaponized against Donald Trump and only against Donald Trump. And that, folks, is going to make a very, very interesting trial. Donald Trump is, is going to get through this, folks. This is just a distraction. OK, it's just a distraction. Maybe it may be an interesting trial, but in the end, it's going to the Supreme Court. It's going to get appealed. So he's going to win on appeal no matter what. OK, no matter what, it's going to a conservative majority court. You know, you got to be worried about Kavanaugh and obviously uh, what's his name. But you also have to remember this guy, Jack Smith, has already lost two cases to the Supreme Court. One of them was eight to zero. Not, not one Supreme Court judge agreed with his prosecution and threw the whole damn thing out. And so this is this guy is known for stretching the law like this. And that is exactly what he's doing. It is like that. That what is that guy? Alexander Bavera, uh, Lavrenti Barrera, where he said, show me the man and I'll show you the crime. That is exactly what this is, folks. And I know you've been hearing it a lot. Because this is what is happening, and the left just cannot see it. They can't see it, folks. Absolutely cannot. All right, so I just wanted to let you guys in on that. That was my little theory on Stephen D'Antuono and why this whole thing is a distraction. And his his transcribed interview is essentially saying, look, that entire raid on Mar-a-Lago, nothing was done by the book. Everything was out of protocol. Nothing made sense. And they didn't follow the rules. And so I'm wondering if Donald Trump's defense team is going to use that right out the gate to try and get this whole thing thrown out because the, the search warrant shouldn't have been issued in the first place. And the raid with the SWAT team to recover documents because of a, the Presidential Records Act should be a civil case, not a criminal case. There should not have been an FBI SWAT team in the first place, folks. And so I think that's a first thing that this judge needs to look at. And personally, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but listen, like I said, folks, I've been I've been hitting the books really hard in this census indictment. And that's why I haven't really talked about it a whole lot. Um, so we already talked about the Grassley having the audio tapes or Grassley essentially saying that the Burisma executive has audio tapes, 17 to be exact, 15 of Hunter Biden speaking with the executive and two of them with Joe Biden directly. And in those audio tapes, I guess, referring to Joe Biden as the big guy. Could you imagine, folks, if that was the case, that would tie everything together because you would have Tony Bobulinski would be the second eyewitness that has come out and said that. Joe Biden is the big guy. And if Joe Biden is the big guy, they have an email from Hunter Biden saying that they have 20 percent for the big guy, 20 percent of a payment made from a corrupt Ukrainian gas company that was held for the big guy in quotations. That's what that's what they called him. OK, so if if in these recordings, this Burisma executive refers to Joe Biden as the big guy, too then all this is over. That would be the connection a prosecution would need. And in fact, I think it's crazy that they're leaving all this up to a, a few Republicans in the Congress to take care of. 
No special counsel appointed, no special investigations appointed. The media is not even interested, folks, not even interested. They are more interested in getting Joe Biden out of trouble than they are actually getting to the bottom of if it's even real or not. I think the media knows it's real. They know Joe Biden's corrupt, just like everybody on the left knows this guy's corrupt, and they just don't want to know. It's like the kid hiding under the blanket because they think they see a scary guy in the closet. So they think by just hiding under the blanket, the guy's going to disappear. I think that's what we have. We have a serious case of denialism, folks. I think that's we've had a case of denialism for the last four years, four years. I would say longer than that. These people completely deny Donald Trump even being a good president, even though on paper, on graph, mathematically, statistically, everybody was better under Donald Trump. Eight out of 10 people were better under Donald Trump. Statistically, that is a mathematical certainty, folks. And these people just cannot see it. They don't see it because if they seen it, that would mean Donald Trump is a better president than Joe Biden. And if Donald Trump's a better president than Joe Biden, then you should probably want to vote for Donald Trump in 2024 election. You see how all this is being wrapped up? So I just wanted to clear that up for you guys. Pay attention to the Steve, uh, the Stephen D. Antuono. I think this is a very interesting, uh, this is a very interesting twist that I think is probably going to come out in the coming weeks of this, uh, in of this, this. I don't know what it, it's not a trial yet um, of the Donald Trump, uh, the Donald Trump indictment. This entire sham, this kangaroo court, this political weaponization of the, our justice system. Essentially, Joe Biden, Joe Biden promised us unity and he just gave us a banana republic, which is unfortunate. All right. But so this is something else Joe Biden did that really pisses me off. So the White House was flying a trans flag and Tom Fitton over there at Judicial Watch says it's illegal. And so I looked up the United States flag code. And according to the code. Which is so according to uh, Section 7E of the United States Flag Code, uh, this this pertains to the proper display and handling of the United States flag. So according to the United States Flag Code, when the U.S. flag is displayed with other flags, there are guidelines to follow. In general, the U.S. flag should be placed in a position of prominence, which means it should be placed to the right of other flags or at the center and higher when displayed on a stage or podium. If multiple flags are displayed on poles, the U.S. flag should be raised first and lowered last. It should also be hoisted higher than the other flags if they are equal size. These guidelines reflect the respect and honor according to the U.S. flag as the national symbol. So that's not what Joe Biden did. And in fact, he actually did the opposite. Go figure. But no, no big deal. You're not going to hear anything about this. I think personally, I think it's disgusting, folks. I really do. I've never seen this much disrespect for our country in my entire life, man. I really have it. It is really crazy to me that we have people running our country that hate this place. I mean, it's just so bizarre to me. Um, Let me find the article here. So I got an article here, again, from the Washington Times, hat tip to Jeff Mordock, uh, titled, Biden takes heat for violating U.S. flag code with pride flag displayed. This is really going to piss you off at the end of this article, but we got to get through it quick. So the Biden administration is taking heat for its Pride Month display over the weekend, with critics complaining about the White House violating the U.S. flag code and its display of rainbow colored pride flag. President Biden celebrated LGBTQ, LG, LGBTQ, what the hell? <laughs> President Biden celebrated LGBTQ. You guys need to get a copy editor, man. Copy editor. Come on. President Biden celebrated LGBTQ community over the weekend at an event on the White House lawn with singers and speakers representing LGBTQ causes. So look, this is why it's so crazy. It should have just been with LGB. And I stand firm with my comment saying the LGB community needs to drop the T. Drop these people like it's hot, man. They are way too much baggage for this community. The LGB community fought way too hard to get where they're at just to have this transgenderism ideology hijack it and, and run it into the ground. That's my opinion. Look, I'm not part of the gay community, so I'm just I'm just trying to... Uh, 
to any of my gay listeners out there, any of my listeners out there that may be gay, I'm just letting you know, you need to start this movement. You need to start this trend because the transgender community or the tra- this transgender ideology is destroying the LGB movement, the LGB community completely. So as part of the celebration, the administration hung a pride flag from the center of the side of the White House that faces the South Lawn, flanked by two American flags. Critics complained that the display violated U.S. Flag Code Section 7E, which requires the American flag to be the center of any display featuring multiple flags or pennants. So Senator Roger Marshall from Kansas from Republican called moving the American flag to the side a freaking disgrace. Not only is it in breach of U.S. flag code, but it is clear example of the White House's incompetence and insistence on putting their social agenda ahead of, ahead of patriotism, Mr. Marshall tweeted. Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton also weighed in on Twitter and said, quote, to advance revolutionary transgender agenda targeting children, Biden violates basic tenet of U.S. flag code and disrespects respect disrespects every American service member buried under its colors. He wrote men died for our flag and Biden spits on their graves. Damn, damn. Talk show host, Michael Savage wrote, yeah, that is savage. The name is fitting. Damn. This guy just said, man, men died for our flag and Biden spits on their graves. (laughs) That is savage, dude. He is man. The guy is, he has no respect for our military. That's one thing that pisses me off. It's like the left wants us to live in this this Orwellian utopia, man. They want us to live in this or- George Orwell's 1984 novel and just com- and just have this th- this imaginary image of Joe Biden being like this great guy who cares about the country and cares about the soldiers. And then you look at him and you actually go through the things and you're like, wait a minute, did he just check his watch while he was at a eulogy for the soldiers that got blown up over in Afghanistan? Like, are you serious? This guy just looked at his watch while these these parents are right here, dude. And he just looks at his watch. It's like, whoa, 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 man. Like, you can't be this guy just give a flying shit about the the soldiers, folks. I'm sorry. And then they want to turn around and project on the Donald Trump. And you guys remember how they said he called soldiers losers and cowards? He never said that, folks. That was a huge lie. Just a, a an October surprise that popped up that they needed just to get one more stab in at Donald Trump before the election. The whole damn thing was a lie. Can you imagine, do you ever see Donald Trump ever saying anything like that? Well, you know what? I got a piece of audio here I want to share with you. This is Donald Trump at a Waffle House, and um, a girl brought up a portrait of a Medal of Honor recipient and brought it to him. This guy is in a Waffle House just making the rounds, folks, being Donald Trump. Here, check this out. This is Bonnie. Hi. Can you tell them the story, please? I am a Medal of Honor portrait artist. Um, this is Sergeant Major Pat Payne, who you awarded the Medal of Honor. And um, this is actually his signature. Do you think I could look like that if you did me? Absolutely. Give me that perfect jaw. Absolutely. All those muscles and everything else. Absolutely, So how is it? Was he put really pass away? No, he's actually currently still alive. Oh. Um, he is how currently active. Active duty. He's about. Um, I think he's in his in his forties. Um, he's still maxing out his. Is fitness he injured exam. or anything? Um, no, sir. No, he is. Seems, that's unusual. Yeah, the Medal of Honor is. guys usually are pretty rough shape, right? Yeah. Beautiful job. You Thank did. you so much. Thank you. I want to look like that guy. <laughs> Mr. Tell President, Mr. President, okay. my son is going into the Army next oh, month. Wow. Can I get a photo, please? Come on, get over here. He'll end up being a general. <laughs> so I have a question for you. Go ahead. Can I hop get back in? to office? Can I get an internship? I think you can. <laughs> is this your mom? Yeah. Yes, may, I, may I have the honor to hop That's how you in? turn out this thing. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Need, you need me to take it? I can take it. Give me that best one. <laughs> Thank you. I saw one for the book. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Where'd you get the baseballs? Where'd you get them? Walmart. (laughs) (laughs) Would you sign my hat? Thank you very much, Mr. President. Beautiful hair you have. What are you covering your hair up? I've got, I've got the, uh, you know, walk with pride. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's go. Come on, mom. (laughs) Come on, get in here. Come Come on, on, mom. When mom talks to me, listen. Thank you. Um, My kid's uncle right here. Wonderful. I took three for good luck. Thank Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 
There you go, folks. Classic Donald Trump at the Waffle House, just making the rounds, signing signing uh, portraits of Medal of Honor recipients that he actually gave a Medal of Honor to, and then taking a picture of a young guy that's going into the military and his mom. This is classic stuff, man. How anybody can hate this guy is beyond me. I just don't get it. I do not get how people can hate this guy this much. That is the media, folks. Blame the media on that. They brainwash these people to hate this man. So now you take that and compare it to Joe Biden checking out his watch in front of parents at a a eulogy of soldiers. I, I don't know if you'd call it a eulogy. I'm not sure what it's called. It's where the soldiers are at the airport or the soldiers come off the planes from Afghanistan. He's sitting there watching these caskets come off the plane and the guy checks his watch. I mean, come on, folks. And then the White House press secretary, Saki, I think it was at the time, defends it and said, oh, he had a really important meeting on his mind. So it just and that just goes that just goes away. Nothing, nothing to be seen here. We're just supposed to memory hole the whole thing and not only memory hole it, but actually do the opposite and say this guy actually cares a lot about soldiers. It's just so bizarre, folks. I hope you guys see this. I know my listeners do, my fellow conservatives. I know you see this and it doesn't really give me, it doesn't really make a point for me to be telling you this, but for anybody else out there listening, you have to see this, man. You got to see this. There is no way you can't see the difference between the two administrations, man. You can't. I mean, unless you're just that blinded by hate. It's just, I don't, it's unbelievable. So this whole transgender flag, the centerpiece of two American flags is disgusting. It is disgusting. Like, who does this? Like, seriously, I, I mean, I was shocked. I said, there's no way that this guy did this. There's no way. That is just too much. That is that is scraping at the bottom of the barrel, man. I thought it was a joke. I said, it's got to be artificial intelligence or something. No, no, it's real. The picture's right there. The trans flag is in between centerpiece of the American flags, folks. That is a disgrace. I mean, so disgusting. And that's not even the worst part. Listen to this. So Mr. Biden responded to the criticism by posting a photo of the pride flag on his official Twitter page. The photo had both American flags cropped out of the picture and says in the tweet today, the people's house, your house sends a clear message to the country and to the world that America is a nation of pride. What the hell, folks, are we dealing with here? Does this not infuriate people? This, I mean, my Lord. I know the leftist Democrats are not into the whole patriotism, but this is disgusting, folks. You, If you don't want to stand for the American flag and sing, sing the anthem, if you don't want to have pride in our nation, that's fine. You don't have to. But don't put a sexual ideology, this transgender ideology in front and on top of our patriotism, our country, a country that men died for to protect the same rights that you're claiming you want. So it's like, dude, th- this is so oxymoronic, man. It's, it is the same thing to me as kneeling during the anthem. The flag represents the men and women who died for this country, for you to have the right to kneel. That's, that's great, is it not? So then wouldn't you want to be proud of that and stand? <laughs> it's like, it's so paradoxical, man. It's like we're in a freaking bizarro world. Like it's April Fool's. Every day is April Fool's Day. And I'm just waiting for someone to come up and be like, no, nah, I'm just joking. That was artificial intelligence that, that put a, a trans flag in between the two American flags, at the centerpiece of the White House. April Fool's. <laughs> it's like, man, dude, we got some serious, serious problems, folks. Serious problems. And uh, look, I just want people to know, don't give up. Do not surrender. Hang in there. I told you, and I oh, I tell you all the time, things are going to get worse before they get better. But just know that things are getting worse. <laughs> I know that doesn't make you feel better, but things have to get worse in order for them to get better. Okay? 
Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create bad times. Bad times create strong men. And strong men create good times. That is the cycle that we find ourselves in. So you have these cycles that happen all the time. And unfortunately, we are in bad times right now. But just remember, these bad times are creating strong men right now, folks. And so I and these strong men are going to take us to a more prosperous and free American country, man. I promise you, we are at the precipice. The pendulum is starting to swing the other way. I see signs all over. Um, I know it's anecdotal. I have a lot of Democrat friends that are absolutely admitting 100 percent that voting for Joe Biden was a mistake. And not just them, but their entire families think that what they did in voting for Joe Biden was a big mistake. Now, I don't know if they're going to vote for Donald Trump, but I can guarantee you they're not voting for Joe Biden again. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, I told you all this was correlated with one another. This is why they're coming after Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not a threat to the people. He's not a threat to you. You are actually prospering under his administration. Donald Trump is a threat to them. He's a threat to the machine, folks. And so I want you to remember that and just just remember that things are going to get better. So I want you guys to have some hope out there. I was actually going to get into a couple more things, but that's all I ha- that's all the time I have for. So like I okay, so just a little summary of what we talked about today. Stephen D'Antuono, that's going to be a person of interest in the coming weeks in this investigation, folks, and this whole Trump indictment. This is very interesting interview that he did with the House Oversight Committee at the same exact time this whole indictment thing was popping off. There a lot of stuff happened during the Trump indictment, folks. That day that Thursday, Friday, when this was announced, there was so much stuff that happened. Um, you know, like I said, the war, China's preparing for war, we now know. They got some they got bases going up in Cuba and have had bases since 2019. And they're they're creating eavesdropping bases, eavesdropping programs over in Cuba, paying Cuba a billion dollars. That's crazy. They are preparing for war, folks, and we are not. So that happened during the Trump indictment. All kinds of stuff happened. This world horror the the World Health Organization is starting this program called One Health or One World or some crazy shit where they're essentially all these countries are going to forfeit their sovereignty anytime there's ever a another if there's ever another pandemic. Yeah. And and guess who wants to sign the United States up for that? You guess it. Joe Biden wants to relieve sovereignty, forfeit the United States sovereignty to a world organization, a world health organization that's called the one, the one project or some shit like that, the one health. And then people like, like, it's the dumbest thing. You would think it's all like some kind of freaking movie, man. Like the, some kind of comedy, like, I don't know, man. It's like a sick joke, but there's no punchline. It's not a joke. All this crazy shit is happening. And so, I mean, like I said, people just hang in there. It's going to get better, folks, I promise. So Stephen D'Antuono and the defense of Donald Trump, Donald Trump's defense. This is going to be an easy case, I think, folks. The only thing this comes down to is that audio tape that came out and the document that was supposedly in that audio tape. We don't even know where the document is. Does Trump have it? Does Trump not have it? And this is the first thing that everybody needs to remember. And you too, lefties, if you're listening, Donald Trump is allowed to have classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. He's allowed, presidents are allowed to take classified documents with them so that they can negotiate, figure out which documents they want to keep and which documents are going to be going back. But that is a civil case, folks. That is not a criminal case. This should have never been brought up as a criminal case. And so this entire thing, I think, should be thrown out by the judge in Miami, personally. And another thing I found interesting is the same judge that's overseeing this case was the same judge that that ordered a special master in Trump's favor for the documents. So the same judge. I don't know. Let's all you got to hope is that she's fair. That is all the people need. Donald Trump just needs a fair judge, not a biased judge, a judge that is not influenced by hatred of Donald Trump or a judge that is easily pressured by outside forces, which the left and the Democrats are extremely good at, folks. So this judge, I hope she's ready, man. I hope she's ready because she's going to be getting a lot of pressure. Look at look at freaking 
Justice Kavanaugh. He, he had someone there trying to assassinate him. And so these people, man, and again, we're supposed to just forget that ever happened. Forget that ever happened. Like the, the leftist media didn't just provoke some crazy asshole to go out and try and assassinate Kavanaugh and his entire family. So look, we are in some crazy times for sure, but I assure you this case is going to be very interesting and it's most definitely a constitutional crisis. So leave it up to the Democrat Party and these radical, crazy ass leftists to bring us to a constitutional crisis. The same people who claim they're defenders of democracy. They just say that, folks. It's all a lie. The entire party is one big lie. If you don't believe their lies... They don't get votes. That is the only way they get votes and creating division. That is it. They create division and they lie to the American people. That's how they get votes. They run on emotion. They run on fear and they and they own the language. They're masters at manipulation, folks. Masters at projection. Masters at manipulation. Masters at language. They're just good. They're better than Republicans at cheating at all the wrong things. So. All right, well, that's all I got for today's show. I didn't really mean to take that much time on the Stephen D. Antuono thing. I hope it made sense. Um, I, I kind of, I, I should have summarized that article for you, but hey, at least you got every detail of it. Um, but that's all I got for today. Very interesting stuff. I hope, thank you guys for tuning into the show. And if you got any questions, you can get a hold of me at Stephen Toriello Show at gmail.com. Uh, that's Stephen Toriello Show at gmail.com. You can also watch the show on Rumble. You can watch the show on YouTube for now. We'll see how that goes. Also, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok. Um, I think I even got a Locals account. It The show's everywhere, folks. It's everywhere. So if you want to find it, it can be found. It's very easy. You can Google the name Stephen Toriello Show, or you just Google my name, Stephen Toriello. You will find all my stuff. And you guys just let me know how you're liking the show, man. And let me know how you like these live episodes, too. Because, I mean, this really helps me. It really cuts back on a lot of time for me as far as editing and stuff. So just let me know what you guys think about the live shows. I've had a lot of people say they like it, and I haven't had anybody tell me they don't like it. But I don't know. Usually people don't they don't respond with stuff like that. I don't know. We'll find out. But if you do, let me know. Get a hold of me, Stephen Toriello Show at gmail.com. And thank you guys for tuning into the show. Make sure you share the show with your friends and family. And also, if you could, please, I'd really appreciate it if you followed the show. And tell your family to follow the show too. Just tell them to hit the little plus sign on Apple Podcasts or I don't know what it is in, in Spotify. I don't use Spotify, but just please tell them to follow the show. It really helps. And also tell them to leave a five-star review. Leave a five. Uh, tell them tell them to give me a five. I would really appreciate it, guys. And as always, I want you guys to have a good day. Have a great week. God bless you, and God bless America. You guys have a good day. Bye-bye.